Today we're going to be moving on to one of my favorite units in the entire AP curriculum, which is Romanticism. So it's a common misconception that Romanticism is associated with love and romance, that it's not necessarily true. Rather, Romanticism as a movement embodies a spirit of freedom and expression that is supposed to be challenging the reason and logic of Enlightenment thinking in a lot of cases. Remember that before this, again, we're seeing this swinging pendulum of idiotic ideologies that is happening at this time where we're starting off with Rococo, which is very frivolous and fun and sexy, and then we're going to neoclassicism, which is very stiff and steeped in morality and reason, and romanticism is starting to pull away from that stiffness and morality, and people are just really emotional and don't really know what to do with their feelings. So there's really a celebration of independence, both politically speaking and individually speaking, deviating from one's assumed position in society or one's expectations, historical precedent, and branching beyond into these new possibilities in this rapidly expanding and changing world. So the typical romantic artist and writer is what we oftentimes refer to as a troubled genius. Oftentimes the work that they are creating is reflecting this mode, this mood of being very temperamental, critical, tired, and being kind of melancholy and emphasizing these ideas that focus on the anti-hero. So everybody is basically super emo and very kind of angsty in the way that they are writing about and drawing and painting their ideas. And we're going to be seeing this theme recurring throughout the Romantic um, art period. So important thing to note about Romanticism is that there's not necessarily a unifying artistic style that we're seeing within Romanticism. There's going to be a lot of references to classical tradition. So similar to what we're seeing in the neoclassical period, a lot of artists are still very much influenced by what the Salon wants, which is that, again, that gigantic gallery show that is held in Paris every year where all the artists want their artwork to be exhibited. So there's still certain stylistic conventions um, and ideas that artists are wanting to stick to. Um, so we're not seeing the emergence of the avant-garde quite yet where people are getting into these more different and original modes of depiction, but the subjects that you will be seeing in a couple of these artworks will be deviating from normal subjects. So another thing that is happening during this point in time is industrialization. Industrialization being a lot of these people that live in these more rural areas are moving to urban environments to work in factories. So at this point in time, cities are really gross. They're dirty and polluted. People are living in extremely poor and crowded conditions. And there's a lot of anxiety about industrializations, about industrialization as a whole. So there's actually this nostalgia that is happening where people are like, oh man, I, I wish things were the way that they 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 were in the old days and everything was simpler and easier. So we actually see a lot of previous art styles being referenced. We see this nostalgia that is coming back in a lot of different architectural styles in particular. We also see this renewed fascination with nature and this phenomenon that is frequently referred to as the sublime. So the sublime refers to the excitement and fear inducing elements of nature. Like, nature you scary is essentially what that means. Like, it's beautiful, and it's breathtaking, and it's completely awe-inspiring, but it's also terrifying. Like, we're, we're talking about fearsome oceans and thunderstorms and rolling clouds. We're, we're talking about, like, these, these massive, uncontrollable phenomena that people are really starting to, to, to depict more frequently in art. So we're also um, at this point in time seeing a lot of colonialization and westward expansion. We're continuing off of the coattails of the neoclassical era where there's this emphasis on morality and moral obligation. One of the ways that that is manifesting in particular is 
in Western attitudes towards non-Western places. So non-European places, non-Western places are oftentimes seen as foreign and exotic, and the people there are oftentimes fetishized. What's interesting is that a lot of times the artists that are creating artwork in these era are creating narrative pieces that are supposedly happening in the Near East, but they've never actually been there. So they're creating these fantastical images that are utilizing a lot of stereotypes and false narratives to create this vision of what the East, particularly um, Central Asia and North Africa, look like. So oftentimes these portrayals are not positive, and in fact they're very negative. They, they kind of paint this region as being uncivilized and barbaric and succumbing to uh, temptations. And there's this notion that these places are so barbaric that they need to be civilized, they need to be inhabited by a Western presence to bring them to morality, essentially. So we're seeing this almost ideological colonialism as well. So our first work focuses on this more nostalgic element of Romanticism. This is the Houses of Parliament, in the Palace of Westminster in London, England. You probably recognize Big Ben, which is one of the most famous landmarks in London right here. So this is the village clock for all of London. When you're actually in London proper, you can hear it from everywhere in the city. It's, it's quite remarkable how loud it is. So when you look at this artwork, you're probably recognizing a couple of things that we've seen in previous units. For one thing, there's a lot of verticality in this piece. The spires are pointing upwards. We're seeing a lot of references to Gothic architecture. So at this point in time, again, London is a sprawling metropolis. It's very dirty. Like you can't even really breathe when you're outside because there's so much ash and coal and soot. So there's this nostalgia, this aspect of longing for simpler times when the city wasn't so busy and when it wasn't so dirty. So one of the ways that that's manifesting is by referencing these earlier historical styles, in this case, Gothic art and architecture. So the story behind this is that when the original Houses of Parliament, which were made about a thousand years ago, burned down in 1835, there was actually a contest that was hosted um, to look for a new design. And there were around 100 submissions, and this design, which combines elements of classical architecture and Gothic architecture, was the one that was selected. So currently, the Houses of Parliament serves as a meeting place and office space for members of the British Parliament. So here's Westminster Hall right here. So this is one of the only portions of the building that survived the fire in 1835. Um, the ceiling was added in 1390. This is called a hammer beam arch where there's these, um, it's a, a very enlarged space. And instead of having these columns that come down the middle, um, we have these additional fortifications that are en enlarging the interior space. So this sort of space was meant for very large ceremonies and courts. We can see an integration of these Gothic art elements like stained glass windows and of course these pointed arches. Here's an image of the central lobby right here. So this central lobby is the area that connects the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So this is where constituents could meet parliament members. So the, the government basically has a a section that is staffed by people that are kind of like average Joes and Janes. And then you have the House of Lords, which are like more established, um, almost kind of like pseudo royalty. And they are working together to dictate the, the common laws of the people. So there's a couple of statues that are inside the central lobby right here. Most of them are made out of white marble, so hearkening back to that classical ideal. And they depict famous kings and queens of Great Britain. We're also seeing a lot of these figures that are inscribed within the arches. So this is a tradition that goes all the way back to the Romanesque period. So again, we're seeing this reference to earlier historical styles, but with a more modern twist. So 
just because there is a lot of war and conflict happening at this time, we're of course going to be seeing similar sorts of themes in the artwork. So I want to give a brief content warning for this piece. It's not particularly graphic, it's in black and white, but it's still upsetting for some students. So this piece is by Francisco de Goya, who was a very prominent court painter for um, French and Spanish royalty in his early life. Um, unfortunately, towards the end of his life, he actually had an illness that caused him to go deaf. He became a recluse and basically shut himself in his house for several years. And when people went into his house after he had died, they discovered that he had actually painted on the walls of his house and he had made this series of extremely disturbing paintings that are now called the Black Paintings. So these paintings are now in the Prado Museum in Spain, and they're perhaps um, Goya's most famous works. But what's interesting is that when you look at Goya's earlier works, they seem sort of optimistic. And then as you move forward in his career, um, the, the paintings get fuzzier and a little bit more disconcerting and almost surreal. And this is manifesting because of probably not only because of Goya's illness, but because of what he is witnessing in his lifetime. So this series called The Disasters of War was actually um, created to criticize the French occupation of Spain um, during this massive war in Spain. So this war resulted in mass casualties, poverty, and citizens' loss of rights. There was a gigantic social and political upheaval that affected lots and lots of people. So this series explored themes of famine, war, and politics. Oftentimes the images within the series are titled with these statements or questions that betray a sense of exhaustion, hopelessness, and bitterness. So some of these titles are por qué, which means why, no se puede mirar, and they can't see, and se aprovechan, which means, and they take advantage. So this piece, y no hay remedio, means there is nothing to be done. So they're very fatalistic and depressing and, and kind of betray the sense of hopelessness that a lot of people at this point in time are feeling. So this is clearly a narrative here. We have a couple of people who are strapped to these posts in the ground. It looks like there are around three figures. Their heads are hung in defeat. Their shoulders are slouched. They are obviously in the mindset of we have lost and there is absolutely no hope for us. And then, of course, we see this figure on the ground who has been executed, whose body is twisted in this very contorted position. Um, we can see where the gunshots have hit their body and their head and their back. And we get definitely get the sense that these figures are about to follow this poor man's fate here. So there's been a couple of... There's been a little bit of commentary from art historians that talks about this grouping of three figures right here um, and the fact that they are tied to a post for execution. So a lot of people say this is very similar to crucifixion imagery. And there's actually a name for this whenever we see like common people or like non-Christ figures that are emulating um, Christian imagery, particularly um, things that, um, that, that Christ was participating in in the Bible. So um, this is called altar Christus. So people participate in Christ and then Christ is working through them. We don't see it that much in the AP curriculum. It tends to be very subtle. So we have a set of French soldiers over here who are aiming their firearms at these figures over here. And we can actually see the barrel of some guns over here that are aimed at this figure in the foreground. This is a very interesting compositional choice that was made by the artist to obscure the identity of these um, figures in the foreground that are executing this one. I also thought it was interesting, too, that the barrels of these guns have been obscured by the figure. So this piece was created using dry point etching. So it is a print um, and was created by having a piece of metal incised with a stylus. And then the artist then rubs ink into the grooves that were created by the stylus and then prints the image onto a sheet of wet paper. So this is a printmaking method that was also used by Rembrandt.
So again, when you're looking at the paintings that Goya did while he was um, a court painter versus the images that he did later in life, you're seeing this kind of dissociation that is being physically represented. Here are a couple of other works. This is perhaps um, one of Goya's most famous works, the 3rd of May, 1808. It became a kind of like cultural phenomenon, and we actually see this painting referenced a lot in um, contemporary art today. This is one of several black paintings. These were the paintings that were on Goya's walls that were found after he died, and then the walls were taken to the Prado, and then this is the most famous of the black paintings called Saturn Devouring His Son. So keep in mind that he had these on the walls of his house. Like, this is how... This, is, this, this was essentially his mindset towards the end of his life, which is, is always a very intriguing subject, subject for art historians. Our next piece is The Grand Odalisque by Ingre. So this was a work that he created earlier in his career. Um, later in his career, he focused more on classical norms and ideals, and he did a lot of portrait work. Um, but in these earlier pieces, we're definitely seeing an influence of mannerism, which you'll recall was that movement where everybody would, had very strange bodily proportions and the colors were very bright. And it was the period that was right after the High Renaissance when everybody kind of lost their minds after the sack of Rome. So there's also this um, very heavily implied notion of exoticism that is happening here. The artist is trying very hard to say this person is not from Western Europe, even though the model was probably some Parisian chick. So what he has done is that he has placed a bunch of items in this ensemble here that say this figure is not from Western Europe, they're exotic. So we have a hookah pipe over here. Um, we have this peacock feather fan. The figure is wearing a turban and there's these oversized pearl and pearls and this um, sort of brightly colored ochre drapery and jewelry. So there's de there's definitely a suggestion here that this is something that is happening outside of Europe. This is representing the temptations and desires of places other than here. So what artists are doing is that they are literally painting the Near East as a place that emphasizes this sort of shocking depravity and would have certainly supported this notion like, oh, of we need to go over into these places and civilize these people and bring them into the modern era. Um, it is our moral duty to do so. So this piece represents a subset of romanticism that is called Orientalism. So this is where European artists um, are creating these fantastical, fetishized images of an imagined barbaric East. In this particular case, it, we're looking at these um, civilizations that are in what is now called the Middle East and and North Africa. Um, we Orientalism in this sense is not necessarily referring to East Asia. But this is the region that um, Napoleon and his armies are occupying at this point in time. So this would have been something that was most familiar um, to Western Europe. So again, as I mentioned, Ingre never actually went to the Middle East or Northern Africa, and these images were complete fantasies and fabrications. There's other elements of this piece that are suggestive of this kind of this mismatching this and this otherness, particularly in the figure herself. She has these very strange proportions. Her back is extremely long and her limbs are very noodly and rubbery. And she's twisted in this very unnatural position. She's essentially been contorted in such a way to cater to the male gaze. She is supposed to be this alluring and sexy figure, like she defies gravity in a lot of cases. I'm pretty sure breasts don't actually stand out like that. There is this the sense of like this is a perfect like Barbie doll like figure that can only exist in fantasies. So this is certainly a continuation of this trend of reclining female nudes that we saw with paintings like the Venus of Urbino. Um, but this work is really quite literally stretching reality to create a compositionally balanced and fantasy fulfilling image. So it's kind of going back to this fanciful frivolous eroticism that we saw in the Rococo era. <laughs> 
So here's a couple of other artworks that are considered quote unquote Orientalism. When you look at the architecture, you might recognize specific elements of things, like we see some Islamic tile artwork back here, which has been beautifully rendered. We can see the calligraphy up here and the use of arabesques and these pointed arches. But we have this very stereotyped image of this nude figure that it, and this other dude playing a, um, a flute and it's like a snake charmer and everybody's sitting around and watching them. So there's, and then in this image over here, this is an image of a harem, which is a very popular subject in Orientalism where you have these figures that are language about in like these concealed spaces and they're covered in jewelry and there's oftentimes these Persian rugs and other ornamental hangings on the wall. They're supposed to show this kind of this very exotic and like tempting place with all of these like new and strange things essentially. Like it's emphasizing otherness. Our next work is by Eugene Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People. You probably recognize this piece from the cover of the Coldplay album that was released a couple years ago. Um, so this piece is supposed to be an allegorical and symbolic representation of the July Revolution of 1830, which itself was a prelude to the June Rebellion of 1832. So the June Rebellion of 1832 was the event that was featured very heavily in Victor Hugo's novel Les Mis, Les Miserables. And then, of course, the musical as well for all of you MNT students. So the tri the composition here is very triangular. So this is lending a sense of order and also hierarchy. Triangular compositions are particularly common in Romanticism artworks, um, just because they convey this sense of order. Of course, we have the central figure right here, um, Lady Liberty. She is not an actual like human being that was out there at this point in time. Like she's an allegory. Think of her like the Statue of Liberty. That's not an actual person, but rather a representation of an idea. So she is shown here. Um, bearing this tricolor flag and then she also is moving forward um, she is looking back towards her constituents and she is obviously in motion given the um, the way that her drapery is flowing she is also wearing a phrygian cap which is a symbol of freedom and this kind of cap was oftentimes worn by enslaved people who had recently been freed so that is certainly um not a coincidence that she's wearing this kind of hat right here. So she is moving forward. And then there's also a couple of other important figures that are allegorical in nature. They don't really necessarily represent historical like figures, but rather these um, members these these kind of like demographic constituents that were participating in the revolution. On the left, we have this figure who is in an apron. He looks sort of shabby. His clothing is um, somewhat worn and old, and he is bearing a saber, and he has a pistol tucked into his waistband. He is supposed to represent the members of the lower classes, so like the factory workers and a lot of the people that moved into these urban environments um, to, to be staffed in factories. We have this figure right here who is clutching a hunting rifle, so a, a, a weapon that you typically wouldn't see in war, but rather for recreation and hunting. He looks a little bit less sure of himself than this fellow over over here. He's in a top hat and he's got a nice west coat. He's obviously dressed nicely. He doesn't quite look like he knows why he's there. He's supposed to be representing the members of the upper and middle class that were participating in this revolution. And my favorite character over here, which is this student over here who is who has a pistol in both hands and then also has his school bag um, hanging around his shoulder. So he's representing the students and the young people that are participating in the revolution. The narrative moment of this particular piece is um, toppling a barricade. So we can see some of the stones from the barricade and some bits of wood and these figures in the foreground who have obviously fallen. My favorite is this figure who just randomly doesn't have pants and is missing a sock. I'm not sure what he's doing on the battlefield. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, and then we have Notre Dame Cathedral in the background right here, which is this enduring symbol of municipal and national identity, um, particularly for French people.
and those people who live in Paris. So Delacroix actually talked about this piece pretty extensively in his letters, and he talked about this piece as his contribution to the revolutionary effort. He said, I wasn't physically there in person, but I wanted to represent everybody that contributed and then also contribute in my own way by creating this piece and commemorating all of the individuals who fought in this revolution. All right, we have another artwork that um, I'm going to slap a content warning on. This piece um, talks about um, race-based violence, particularly um, black violence against black people. Um, this piece is titled Slave Ship by J.M.W. Turner. So this piece is subtitled Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying, Typhoon Coming On. And this piece was actually exhibited with a poem that J.M. W. Turner, the artist, wrote himself. So the premise behind this piece was that J.M. W. Turner was a member of this demographic that very heavily disapproved of slavery. Um, in the UK, slavery had been um, abolished for a a little bit of time, but there had been some discussions about reinstating it. This is the 1840s, so there are still um, places uh, out there than the UK that are practicing slavery, and of course the, the profitability of slavery is makes it very ideal for people who are obviously not the ones enslaved. So this piece was really intended to to demonstrate the, the strength of Turner's emotions with regard to the subject and to dissuade people from ever considering this kind of barbaric practice again. So the narrative that is being showed, shown here is based off of an incident that was recorded in 1781 in which a captain of a slave ship actually threw overboard the, um, the slaves who had contracted illnesses and would probably die before they reached the mainland. So the way that insurance policies worked for the these people who are um, were participating in the transatlantic slave trade is that they would be compensated if the um, enslaved people were lost at sea, but not if they died of disease. So one of the things that they did to ensure that they could continue collecting that insurance money was that they would throw the enslaved people overboard and say that they had died at sea, even though that they had um, were succumbing to disease, which is just absolutely barbaric. So this piece was really intended to show that barbarism and how horrible that was. And one of the ways that he does this is by creating this very dramatic blood red sunset. We can see these very evocative brushstrokes that are being used to create the this kind of tempest, this storm that is brewing. We see the waves kind of undulating back and forth in this very anxiety inducing dark current right here and then this this ship over here which is seems quite ill-fated as it's going into this typhoon and her horrifically in the foreground we can see the shackled hands and feet of the enslaved people who have been thrown overboard as they drown and are devoured by fish and birds so this piece was really intended to shock audiences and to inform them of the urgency of this mat of this matter and to really encourage them to put their efforts behind supporting anti-slavery legislation. So one thing that you'll notice in this piece is that the human figures and even the ship, which are supposed to be these like massive larger than life things, are dwarfed in the composition. Nature is obviously reigning supreme here. There is no control on part of any of the humans in this composition. These people who are on the, on the slaver ship are obviously ill-fated, and this is sort of a judgment that has been imposed by Turner saying like these people who did this horrible thing are going to meet their maker and it's not going to be a great time. So that's kind of a theory that a lot of our historians um, have about one of the reasons that Turner created this painting. He's exacting judgment upon the slavers. So this is the poem that Turner actually composed um, in association with this piece and actually um, displayed with this artwork.
Our last piece in the Romanticism series is the Oxbow, also known as View from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, after a thunderstorm. So this piece was composed by Thomas Cole, who was the founder of the Hudson River School. So the Hudson River School was not necessarily like an institution that people went to. Rather, it was this collection of artists that composed artworks kind of within a same grouping and ideology, most of them focused on these large rural landscapes. So this piece itself was strongly associated with this concept of manifest destiny. You'll recall from your U.S. history courses that manifest destiny is this notion that European people are destined and given almost like this God-given right to expand westward and to civilize the land and to make it profitable and nice and cultivated and tamed. So on the right hand side here we see one part of that narrative where everything is super nice, everything is trimmed back, there's a couple of scattered trees and lots of fields, um, there's a couple of boats in the water. There, This area is clearly something that has been tamed by man. It is an agriculturally productive region. And this is contrasting very heavily with the left-hand side of the composition, where we have these tangled, gnarled branches, this blasted tree right here that's probably been struck by lightning or blown over by a strong gust of wind. Um, we also have this very dark and foreboding sky right here. We can see the rain coming down and inundating all of these areas over here on the left-hand side of the composition. We have, and it's kind of encroaching upon this really nice pastoral area over here. So we have this division of this composition into two parts right here. So interestingly, Thomas Cole, like even though he's regarded as like one of the early like American landscape painters. He was actually born in Britain and he spent most of his early life there. He actually traveled to the eastern United States to get away from the hustle and bustle of urban London and how dirty and gross it was. And then he was in New York City and he was like, this sucks too. So he would actually go into the Catskills and other kind of like more rural areas and he would do a lot of landscape paintings based on what he saw in the wilderness. So this was his form of escapism. Interestingly in this piece we see anth anthropomorphic activity in the background here in the terms of this landscape being tamed but we don't really see any people but in the foreground here Thomas Cole has actually painted himself at his easel with his top hat because artists have to look good when they're painting looking back at us the viewers and you'll notice that he is extremely small he is he has dwarfed himself in this massive untamed chaotic foreground here and he's kind of just chilling out and at home in his wilderness over here and then also making a commentary on the relative insignificance of his role in the grand scheme of things so this is definitely another reference to the sublime <laughs> 